All right, guys, we are back with another Real Talk episode. Today, we're going to be talking AR-15 upgrades and some of the parts that I consistently go back to and what I like to use on my rigs. So what do I mean? Let's, let's just take a look at this here. This is the Springfield St. Victor, I believe it is. Um, this is a one of their older models, but you can see this was definitely a more budget type rifle, entry level rifle that probably costs around 700 bucks when it was purchased. And it is pretty darn basic. It's got the front sight post, it's got this like weird um, like hand guard that's got a key mod on it, but it's very flimsy. So I don't really know how much, I mean, it's not very flimsy, but it's definitely got some wiggle room. And um, there's just a lot of things that I would like to improve on this rifle, which you can already see I did one. Uh, do not judge me for the red anodizing, please. But we have the radiant selector switch on here and it's on the 45 degree throw. And I guess I'll just start with that. So radiant selectors, they're my favorite for a reason. They're so easy to change out. You, they have a one side that's longer than the other side. I'll walk up and show you guys this. So you guys can see right here, this is the radiant selector on a 45 degree throw. It's reversible. So you can, if you like a 90 degree throw, you can use this on a 90 degree throw as well. And you can see right there, it's just really quick. It's really tactile, really, uh, really snappy, which I like. I like that it's very, you know, you hear it clicking, you know when it's on, you know when it's off. And does that extra short throw, you know, make you that much faster? No. But the reason I like the short throw is because when I, when I re-engage the trigger, or when I re-engage the safety rather, so I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm doing my drill, and then I go to put the safety back on, it's just a very easy flick of the finger. Um, I've been training recently a lot more um, to ensure that every time I run a drill, it's safety on, I hear the beep, safety comes off, I run the drill, and then safety's back on. Um, even so much, I know some guys will argue, you should flip the safety on while you're doing a reload. That is something that I haven't been training as much. I've been doing that recently. It definitely is a little bit of a mind, a mind trick there, but the safety, all this is to be said that I run radiant safeties on every single one of my rifles that will me, allow me to take it. In fact, I even have one on the SCAR 17 uh, because it's that good and it's, what I find is the more similarities I can have across all my weapons platforms, the easier it is for me to have my training translate through all of them, right? If I'm training on my SCAR 17 and I have that same selector switch, that's one less thing I need to retrain my brain to do when I'm running the SCAR 17. So, um, but the whole point of this video is to show you guys kind of what I would do to take a rifle from something like this and turn it into something like my URGI, a more modernized, uh, you know, feature rich, so to speak. And these are all creature comforts. This is a perfectly fine fighting rifle. I mean, it's going to get the job done. Uh, is it the sexiest? Absolutely not, but it's definitely better than nothing. And um, so, yeah, I guess we'll just go over from start, from, I guess we can go tip to butt, I guess, because that's something that helps me stay in order as I go through these videos. So, but as I mentioned, since I just talked about it, I'll show you the scar real quick. Since this is mostly about AR-15 upgrades here, um, we'll stick with AR-15 platform because that's just the nature of mil spec. But I'll show you the scar radiant selector here, just so you can see it. That's on the left side of the gun, or sorry, right side of the gun, and on the left side we have the longer switch. So this is from Kinetic Development Group. They have that um, piece that goes to the center on the Star 17. Okay, now let's get back to the AR-15 since we have the URGI. We'll bring this one up. This is kind of my baby right now. I do have the Block 2 sitting right here because I have a comparison video coming out soon on the Block 2 versus the URGI. But uh, both of these have some pretty cool features, which so I'll just keep them both nearby here so we can talk about them. All right, so starting at the front of the gun, muzzle devices. I always go for a flash hider. Why is that? Um, because the AR-15 barely has any recoil as it is, and I'm not uh, shooting these for competition. So I get a muzzle, uh, a flash hider rather than over a muzzle brake because the muzzle brake is very concussive if you're running it uh, indoors or with a team or just even if you're outdoors at the range, it's, it's super concussive and it's not really necessary for a 5.56 in my humble opinion. Now I know that muzzle, uh, muzzle brakes do kind of act like a pseudo uh, sacrificial lamb on suppressors. It really helps with that blast baffle. It helps uh, much more than a flash hider helps as far as people who are smarter than me have told me this who, who know about suppressors. So, But 
all of the suppressors I buy are pretty heavy use suppressors and so I'm, I'm not really worried about my suppressors. If they go down, I'll send them back to the manufacturer to get repaired. I run flash hiders because if you are going to be in a gunfight at night, you don't want to be broadcasting a giant flash of where you're shooting from because then all the enemy has to do is turn towards and shoot towards that flash and then your position is given away, okay? Now, don't be like one of the you know the YouTube heroes in my comment section on my YouTube shorts like, oh, this guy, are you fighting the insurgents? you fighting the Taliban? I don't know, dude. <laughs> I hope not. But the whole point of having these things is not to hunt deer. It's not to defend my home. Of course, you can do those things with it, but it is for fighting tyranny, foreign or domestic. So any foreign force that has any type of, you know, f skill in, in gunfights is going to fucking know where your flash is coming from. You're going to be fucked. Now, that's not to say that I'm going to be a one-man army here. Like, I, I definitely want to need to start training with more like-minded individuals. And I'm starting to get a group of guys together to start training with, taking more training courses. I've actually signed up for a riding training group, do one of their CQB force and force courses, as well as a blue bearing solutions course. So, and there's a couple more in the work. So stay tuned for that. But flash hiders, that's just what I like to use and use whatever flash hider works for your suppressor host. Um, I know dead air is a lot of controversy around it right now, but I have a lot of dead air muzzle devices because the chemo is pretty good overall. And that most modern suppressors have that hub adapter in the back. So you could use whatever QD method you want. So pick whatever muzzle device you'd like. I stick with flash hiders. Here on both of these guys, we have a Surefire, a three prong on the Block 2, and a four prong on the URGI. Uh, moving back from there, uh, barrel profiles. I really, like, like for instance, this barrel right here, am I gonna change this barrel out? No, uh, probably won't change this barrel out. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Unless you have a reason or a specific barrel profile that you're going for, I, I mean, I don't typically upgrade barrels. Now, if I was building a rifle from the ground up and I was looking at barrels to get into, I would look, I would consider Geisley, I'd consider Daniel Defense, I'd consider Sons of Liberty Gunworks, uh, I'd consider Centurion, even though I've never used Centurion, I've used the other three, uh, but I've heard very good things about Centurion, and there's just a lot of good barrel manufacturers nowadays. I've bought a lot of uh, Ballistic Advantage barrels, Honestly, they're, they're great for the money, but I'd probably go with somebody who offers a pin gas block from the factory or at least Sons of Liberty dimples their, their barrels uh, from, from the factory, which is very nice. Although I do have a dimpling jig to dimple my own barrels. And when I remove this front sight post to upgrade this rail, which is the next topic we're going to talk about because rails are important, um, I do have a dimpling jig here so I can actually dimple this barrel or use these pins. If they line up with the gas block, I might be able to use one of these pin uh cutouts from the front side post. I've never actually removed a front side post, so we'll see how that goes. But that's the barrel talk. Um, since we're talking about gas blocks, I prefer usually to stay away from adjustable gas blocks. I've had one adjustable gas block in my lifetime, uh, superlative arms, and it just was a lot of extra work and a lot of extra thought that went into using it. It was a super long set screw that you had to put down in the front of the handguard. To me, it was just a lot easier to mess with buffer weights and springs. That's just me again. I I bought that before I really knew much about the balancing of the buffer weight system uh, with your blowback and stuff. So it wasn't terrible. It was just a lot. It's just an extra part that can fail. So I don't recommend adjustable gas blocks typically. I like to have a pinned, regular, low profile gas block and, and go from there. Now rails. This is one of my favorite topics because the rail really is like what you see on the rifle, right? Like you see this block too. What you see is this quad rail here. And when you see the quad rail, you're like. That's a fucking, you know, that, that's a badass gun, dude. Um, the Block 2 has one of the most iconic Riz 2 rails on it. And obviously, this rail has, you know, it's a quad rail. So a lot of people made quad rails, but you kind of, they all kind of blend together, right? Like, look at this gun, and it kind of looks like all the guns from the early 2000s. And uh, obviously, great rail. So I think one of the most important parts of your rifle, besides your barrel and your bolt carrier group and those, you know, those moving functioning parts, right, is going to be the rail system. Because that is going to be, uh, you know, what's protecting that barrel and, you know, holding your accuracy. And also, it's going to be, you know, holding any IR laser aiming devices if you ever want to go full cool guy and get some lasers and night vision stuff. So, it's also one of the most iconic, kind of what makes your rifle look the way it looks. So, uh, here are two of my favorite companies. Uh, these rails in particular, as well, are some of my favorites. The Riz 2, again, there's really nothing else I could say about it. It's, it's phenomenal. It is, is a little heavy, but for what it is, it's actually not that bad. Um, the Mark 16 here that comes in the URGI, also another great rail. Um, it's been growing on me quite a bit, actually, uh, since I got it. But there's another rail from Geyser that I like. 
as much or more. Uh, it's called the Mark 8, and it has more of a crucifix shape. It just feels a little bit more rigid. It's what I have back there on my modernized Mark 12 build, which I can grab and show you guys. So if you take a look deep into the sole of this thing, you can see past the suppressor maybe. Let's see here. You can see it's more of a crucifix shape on the Mark 8. Still has the built-in QD cups in the back. Still has the same Geisley, you know, bomb proof lock up there with a the long barrel nut. And it's just a, it's a very good rail. I think, I feel like it has a little bit more rigidity than the Mark 16, but again, I don't know why Geisley wouldn't have gone with this for the URGI if that was the case. So smarter men than me might have figured something else out that I, that I missed, but I love this rail. This is one of my favorites. And uh, so is the Mark 16. The Mark 16 is growing on me, but this again is probably... If I have had to build my own rifle, this is probably the rail I'm going to buy to do that. So, um, huge fan of this rail. What else can I say? The Riz 3 is pretty cool. I have one here. I just haven't had a rifle to put it on yet. And I'm not taking off the block. The Riz 2 from the Block 2 It's just going to remain on here. Um, I don't like it enough to really replace it. Uh, replace the Riz 2, rather. So, the, the Geisley rails are great. Um, who else makes great rails? I've never tried Sons of Liberty rails, but everything they do is top notch. Um, and besides that, I had the Aero Precision Enhanced Upper Receiver Groups. Not a huge fan of those. They're just really thick. And um, I mean, I was really into those when, I, when they first came out. I thought they were super cool. But as I kind of learned you know, about, about rails and how they interface and whatnot, the more I progressed the more I realize that there's maybe some better options out there. So not to say anything against the arrow enhanced uppers. I think it's still a great design, but and it's cool if you want to recess the suppressor and like run a kind of like a SD look on a, on a rifle, uh, whereas you can't really do that on these ones. But I do like that the, the Geisley rails come with the QD cups built in. I would like to see them still reinforced. It looks like they do, have been doing that more and more on their newer rails. But um, yeah, that's, that's all on the rails, guys. Um, Okay, let's move back from there, and this is really where the upgrades kind of start to take off here, uh, because a lot of rifles that you get out of the box, like this guy right here, will come with a standard mil spec trigger. This actually has a decent trigger in it. It's like a mil spec enhanced. Looks like it's like Teflon or, or um, nickel boron coated or something like that. Um, but a lot of the upgrades that I'm talking about, you'll probably see right here. So charging handle, this is a mil spec, <clears throat> terrible, terrible charging handle. If you had any kind of optic here that would get in your way, this would be very hard to grab. Um, I mean, it's still, it'll get the job done, guys. I don't want to just shit on everyone who has like a regular rifle. There, there are definitely uh, skill issues, you could say. Like you could train them out very easily. Uh, but once you get used to something that you like and you love and you know, then you kind of tend to stick with it. And that's how I am. So all three of these rifles sitting right here have a lot of these things in common. And the first one being, which we already talked about, is the radiant selector switch. So I'll just put this guy in the front since, since it's on the mount and you can see it. So the radiant selector switch is one of those things that I already have on all three of these rifles. Um, any rifle that'll take the radiant selector, I'll put it on there. Another thing all, well, not all three, but the Geisley and the URGI have in common, or, or the Block 2 have in common, is the airborne charging handle. So. Um, the actual Mark 12 modernized has the has the gas buster charging handle. This is the only uh, gas buster charging handle that I own, just to kind of keep it whatever's left of a clone in this thing correct. Uh, but the rest of these have the airborne charging handle, and that is because I like having the ability to have a short little claw there that in case when I'm running this with kit you don't get the chance of this pulling your, your BCG out of battery. So, and it just works very well. It's very well machined, uh, functions really well. Everything about it is just top notch quality, just like everything else that Geisley does. So that's my favorite charging handle, bar none. Uh, Sons of Liberty makes another great charging handle. Radian makes a great charging handle. There's a ton of great charging handles out there, guys. So, excuse me. Um, okay, next, next step, triggers. So upgrading a trigger, so upgrading a charging handle is very easy. Literally pull it out, throw a new one in. Upgrading a selector switch, not quite as easy. And upgrading a trigger, kind of in the same ballpark, you have to remove the, the pistol grip, but it takes minimal tools. You could probably do it in your own home. So for triggers, I always run uh, Geisley triggers if I can. Um, if I'm gonna put a trigger in, if it's not mil spec, it's gonna be a Geisley trigger. Right here we have the Super Dynamic three gun trigger. And this is the same one I have in the URGI. Uh, same 
trigger. I have two of these triggers, one of the URGI, one of the Block 2, which are two of my favorite rifles. So that should say something to you. Those are both single stage. And then in the modernized Mark 12, for more of my precision type setups, I like a two stage trigger. So this guy has the Geisley GS2 trigger in it. So it's their cheapest trigger. It goes on sale regularly for like 140 bucks. And it's a phenomenal two stage trigger. I take this gun out regularly 600 yards and it's a 5.56. So uh, great, amazing trigger from Geisley for a, not a terrible price. Now I've heard LaRue has great triggers for the money. I've dry fired a LaRue, LaRue trigger, never owned one. So do that what you will. A lot of people swear by Timney, a lot of people swear by Trigger Tech. I don't really know. I, I kind of, once I find something, and that's the theme of this video, when I find something that I like that works, I tend to stick with it. So Geisley triggers have always worked for me, so I stuck with Geisley triggers. Geisley rails have always worked for me, so I kind of stuck with Geisley rails over the years, and uh, so on and so forth. But yeah, the guy in the Radiant Selector, Geisley charging handles, this is kind of the theme here. And then what I try to do is minimize the training differences between each of my setups as much as possible so that when I go to the range with a different type of setup, I can just roll right into it without, you know, that selector lever being on a 90 degree throw and having to, you know, break my grip to put it back on safety. So little things like that, that shave time off that also, you know, help with just being comfortable with the rifle. And, and hey, all my rifles are pretty much the same. So when I pick one up, I can kind of mess with them and be, uh, I can mess with them with my eyes closed, for instance, and, and still be proficient with them. So we've covered, Charging handles, we covered selector switches, we've covered triggers. Uh, last thing I'll talk about is ambidextrous controls. Uh, this is something that you can't really upgrade unless you want to mill out material from your mill spec lower. As far as a bolt catch and bolt release on the right side of the gun, this is the Silencer Co. lower, so it has it built in right here. It's one of the lift up types. Where is it at? There it is. So it's this guy right here, and um, the mag's empty, so it's messing with it, but. This is your bolt catch bolt release on the right side of the gun. This is great for if you're clearing a malfunction. You don't have to take your shooting hand off the gun. You just lift this up when you pull your charging hand out of the rear. And then I lock that bolt to the rear. And then to release it, if I'm doing a speed reload, boom, I drop the mag, throw it in. I can just push that down and get back on the gun. Now it is pretty high up, so you do have to like break your grip to get up to it. Uh, same thing goes for the, for the PWS system here. This is the Mark I Mod 2 PWS lower receiver group. So this thing is actually uh, very cool. I'll step back so you guys can see a little bit more of it. This thing's very cool as well because uh, it, it is fully ambidextrous as well, but it has more of the paddle type shape, like the ping pong paddle on this side of the gun. So same thing, I can, I can pull the charging handle back, lock this to the rear, and then I can do the same thing and release it from the top of the paddle as you would on the left side of the gun typically. So. Uh, Ambidextrous slowers are pretty cool. It's kind of the standard moving forward. I think most companies are going to be uh, featuring or you know using ambidextrous lowers on their rifles from now on because it's kind of a standard. Again, there's no reason not to have it, and it does help quite a bit. This one is pretty great. It does have a little um, magazine release on the on the other side of the gun here on the left side. It is protected pretty well, so you're not going to need to worry too much about it getting hit, and you got to push it pretty good. Um, to get it to get it to pop out when you're carrying kit when it's leaning up against your body armor things like that You don't have to worry too much about it, but uh, ambidextrous lowers are, are, are nice to have and I think it's going to be the, the standard moving forward So I guess that's pretty much all the upgrades that I could think of Right now on the spot. I guess besides buffer weights and springs. I'm not depending on your gas block journal your, your gas block size you know, if you're running a can, there's a lot of things to get. Maybe I'll have an own my own video on that because that kit could be its whole own video. Um, oh, stocks. So this one, the Saint actually comes with a pretty decent OEM stock. This is the Gunfighter stock from, from uh, BCM. Comes with the Gunfighter grip as well. So not terrible. I actually enjoy this stock quite a bit. The OEM one seems to be a lot more slimlined. I don't know why. Um, one of these came on the PWS lower and it actually was the same kind of thing. It was like, Less of a cheek weld on this thing uh, versus the one that I actually bought from BCM. It's got a bigger cheek weld. I don't know if it's like Gen 2, Gen 3, you know, Gen 1 versus Gen 2. Um, but with that being said, I only have one gunfighter stock that I purchased, and the rest of my stocks are boom. Uh, B5, B5 SOP mods. They're the best as far as the cheek weld goes. They do have a little bit of play, but I like the storage they, they have, they bring to the table. And they, I love the cheek weld. It's just, and it's an iconic look, especially for something like the Block 2. 
I have one also on the modernized Mark 12 here in the Rally 8000 color, because why not? But I tend to just stick with the B5 SOT mod. Um, yeah, I have I have that gunfighter back there on the Mark 18 because I took it off this PWS lower and switched it out. But if I'm buying a stock, it's typically going to be um, the the B5 SOT mod. Now, besides that, slings, I guess we'll talk slings. I guess that's kind of an upgrade. I, I run Blue Force Vickers slings. There's a ton of good slings out there. Again, I just, Blue Force Vickers slings is what I started with. They've never failed me. And so I've kind of stuck with those. And uh, that covers pretty much it, guys. I think that the best upgrade you could do for your rifle, and let's, I guess let's just start here because this is an important topic. What would I do in the order that I would do it on this rifle? So the, the optic that was on this rifle, was this optic right here. So this is a cheap Chinesium optic. The first thing I did was like, okay, we need to get rid of this optic uh, immediately. I didn't even want this in my house actually. And if you notice the cantilever mount, what well, looks funny about that way that thing's mounted up. So this was on the rifle like this. I mean, it was, it was an atrocity. So this had to go immediately. Uh, that was the first thing was getting a good piece of glass on here and going hand in hand with that is putting a light on here. So this is going to be used for home defense. You need a good, you need a good piece of glass, and you need a good uh, uh, light so you can illuminate what you're shooting at. You don't want to shoot into the dark. <laughs> I know you, some of you guys are going to be like, "Fuck it," you know. But no, you want a, a good red dot or LPVO or whatever it's going to, whatever you choose. I'm not, we're not getting into the optic topic right now. And then a good light. So in order to mount a light well to this rail, we're going to get rid of this plastic, terrible, flimsy you know, key mod rail and we're upgrading it to a Geisley Mark 8 15 inch. So it'll come out, protect most of the barrel and we can mount that light out a little bit further. Uh, Mark 8 rail and DDC. And then we're going to be getting an EOTech EXPS 3-2 up here. And then after that, we're going to be getting, um, what's the last thing? Oh, gas block because we're moving the front side post in order to use that Geisley. So that in the order that I would require this to be upgraded as far as like what I'd recommend, 100% a new optic and 100% a weapon light. That, those are the first two things. And then uh, the, we already got a sling for this thing, so we're good there. After that, we can talk rails. We can talk, so in this case, I, I the weapon light and the rail kind of went hand in hand because again, this thing is pretty terrible. Uh, so if you want to reliably mount a rail or a light rather, you want to put a VFG on there, vertical foregrip on there, reliably, you need a better rail system. So that kind of all went hand in hand. And that's going to run between the EOTech, the rail, and the gas block, and the light. It's going to run about, you know, thirteen dollars to $1,400 to upgrade this thing. But you're getting all top tier quality things. And most of that's the EOTech. Most of that's, you know, $700 for the EOTech. That's, that's what's really the biggest, the biggest cost there. But that's the order I would do it in. Now, after that, what else could I do? Okay, vertical foregrip. Sure, great. Uh, upgrade the charging handle. I think that would be a, a worthwhile upgrade. This trigger being that it's a, a pretty decent mil spec trigger. I'll show you guys what goes to the trigger together. So zero, actually zero take up. Let's, let's, let's step up here a little bit. Let's mess around with this thing. So there's the reset. It's got zero take up. It's instant wall. Actually a pretty great trigger Springfield um, for being out of the box. And so the trigger is pretty good. I wouldn't necessarily you know, spend the, spend the time or money on the trigger right now. I would go with a char new charging handle. I'd probably spend the money on a magnifier. If it was me, maybe putting a QD end plate on here because I use, like to run my slings here typically, but that's pretty much all I would do to this thing to get it to the point where I would be comfortable running this with any of my other rifles that cost a lot more. And I know, yeah, I said $1,300, but that's including the cost of the EOTech. So, so take that into consideration. The upgrades to the rifle really is just a rail. Um, I guess really uh, the only real upgrade I'm doing this is removing the gas, the, the front side post, putting a low pro gas block, putting a guy's rail on it. That's a $400 upgrade, uh, not including labor. If you need to take it to somebody to do it, but we're going to do it here in house. So that's a pretty incredibly cheap thing to do to a $700 rifle. And you know, you're up to 1100 bucks, but now you have something that is of the same, you know, accoutrements, attachments, you have the same features and benefits, right? You know, so to speak, as you would on something like this URGI upper, which the upper alone costs, you know, $1,200. So 
kind of a cool concept. We're going to walk you guys, you guys will see this on the channel again, and, and maybe we'll talk about this again, but I just wanted to talk to you guys real quick with a real talk video about the uh, upgrades that I typically use. And those are the companies and the brands that I typically run. And there's a reason I do. It's not because they pay me. They, in fact, I would love for them to pay me. They don't. Uh, they don't pay me at all. It's just what I've been using for, for years now. And it's what has worked for me once and they work time and time again. So I tend to just stick with that. So with that being said, guys, thank you so much for checking this video out. If you want to support the channel, uh, Super Thanks is a great direct way to support the channel. It's like Patreon, but it's right here on YouTube. Uh, another way to support the channel is going to be using my bro code RDB10 over at brownells.com. Saves you 10% on $150 or more. Some exclusions apply. I've had some of you guys messaging me in the comments, hey, your code isn't working. Some things are excluded from that, but it has to be a minimum of $150 or more. Get you 10% off, and then it helps the channel out a little bit, as well as rangedaybro.com for all of our merch. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Liking, commenting, subscribing. Super corny, but it is the best way to support the channel because it helps us push these messages out in the algorithm, which YouTube does not typically promote post COVID world that we live in. So uh, anything you guys can do can help. Just leaving a comment down below. You know, if you enjoyed this video, what you want to hear about next in one of these real talks, all of that is a huge help. So thank you guys so much. I'm going to do some high knees over these rifles. Talk to you guys soon. Love you guys.